Welcome to Scaling Up, the podcast for water treaters by water treaters, where we're scaling up on water treatment knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. Hello, everybody out there in the Scaling Up Nation. My name is Trace Blackmore, and I am delighted to bring this program to you called Scaling Up. It's been very exciting for me. We've only been on for a couple of months, but I have received so much positive feedback that you guys are really getting a lot out of it. And you're letting me know that by emailing me on scalinguph2o.com. So I appreciate that. I, of course, use that information to guide how I am doing future shows, letting me know what guests to bring on the show, letting me know what to talk about and questions and all sorts of stuff like that. So please keep those coming. And today I'm just going to get right into the interview because most of you out there are on LinkedIn and LinkedIn is uh, probably dominated in water treatment community by James McDonald. And James McDonald and I have known each other for quite a while uh, in the Association of Water Technologies. He's always been a committee chair. I've always been a committee chair. So uh, we go to the committee chair meeting every year. And from that, we've just, we've just gotten to know each other. And I have a tremendous respect for James McDonald. So in fact, when I was thinking about doing this show, he was one of the people that I called because I know that he spends a lot of time on his social media page with LinkedIn. And he's going to talk all about that, I'm sure. So I'm going to try not to do that now, even though it's trying to come out. I'm going to shove it back in. And I asked him, you know, what type of commitment is this? And uh, should I do it? And he didn't pause for a second. He said, absolutely, you need to do this because it is a lot of work. And that's not the reason you need to do it, because I'm sure, as he told me, that we've got plenty of work to do. So we're not looking for more work. But the stuff you get out of because you choose to put this information out there is where the real reward is. Now, I got to tell you, we were on the phone, so he couldn't see my facial expression, but I kind of thought that he was feeding me a line there, but he wasn't. The show does take a lot of work. I'm not going to sugarcoat that at all. There's a, there's a whole bunch that goes into putting up or putting a scaling up podcast on the, uh, on the internet there and then getting the word out so people actually want to listen to it, but it is 100% worth it. And he did not tell me something that wasn't true. He definitely uh, steered me in the right direction. So it only makes sense that I would have James McDonald on scaling up since he was so instrumental in me starting this show. So let's get into our conversation with James McDonald. My lab partner today is James McDonald of Chem Aqua. How are you today, James? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Trace. Well, I am delighted to have you and very excited about the conversation that you and I are getting ready to have. Yes. Well, uh, for those of you out there in the Scaling Up Nation that have not had the opportunity to meet James, you have missed out. So, James, can you please tell them a little bit about yourself? Yes, I have been in, in water treatment since 1997. I'm a chemical en engineer by degree. I have my uh, master's from the University of Louisville, but um, I came out of college and I worked for an environmental compliance company and I got to do um, environmental compliance assessments for the FAA for some army bases. And I got to drive in my car on runways, flying down the, the runway and getting off the last second for a plane lands. And that was really exciting, but no, for near as exciting as my career in water treatment. When I started with Crown Engineering, that became Crown Solutions. And I worked there for, for many, many years. Now I got to wear so many different hats there. It's had a fantastic time. And then when they bought out, were bought out by Veolia back in 2006, the company changed. And when I reached the point where I no longer wanted to be there, I happened to see a LinkedIn ad pop up. That was the very first time I'd ever had seen my job as a corporate engineer written out. And it was like a message from, from, from above, I guess it was. And I hung out my shingle to, to a few more people. And I ended up picking the, the, the job that was on the LinkedIn 
LinkedIn ad, and I ended up here at Chemaqua in 2014, and it has been, been the most fantastic ride. I love what I do, and I love the people I work with, and I love sharing what I do with other people as well. Well, that is obviously true with the amount of work that you do with AWT. And of course, that's how you and I met. And I can't believe that you got that job off of LinkedIn. I figured they were calling you every day trying to get you to jump ship to come over there. It was a LinkedIn. It works. How about that? And I know we're going to talk a lot about LinkedIn in a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. But before we do, I am so impressed by the amount of knowledge that you have. Uh, I know you do. You answer a lot of questions on LinkedIn. But I know just you and I have asked each other questions. and, And the stuff that you come up with is just amazing. How in the world did you become such a well rounded water treater? Well, when you say come up with, I say make up, but, you know, <laughs> regardless, <laughs> you know, I, I started off at Crown Solutions or Crown Engineering. I think I was very lucky to start there. I didn't start off, you know, with, with the NALCO or the BETS experiences where they had, used to have the wonderful schools, the training schools, the water schools they had back then. But I did have a secondary BETS education because the folks I used to work with were BETS employees at one time. So I started off with a well-rounded water treatment company where we did boiler cooling, pretreatment, wastewater as well. And we based our solutions on whatever the proper balance was of the chemistry, equipment, and service. And, you know, we never shied away from anything. We tried anything out there and we sold on our technical abilities. And the fact that I, I was hired to be in our technical support department, but to gain that experience, I had to be out in the field for several years. So I serviced accounts. I ran my pinks and blues. I had, you know, the happy customers and the upset customers, but I I moved in to the office, and any time out there, I saw something that either irritated me because it wasn't easy enough, or there was a be- a, a better way of doing something, and I could make myself a tool or something to make that better. Any time I'd make it better for myself, I would share it with anyone around me out there. And one thing I was taught early on as well was, was that in in our pro- profession and in, in in any profession, people reach a knowledge plateau. They learn as much as they need to do to do their job, and then oftentimes they're comfortable there, and they don't really learn much more after that for for the rest of of their career. And I was taught that as long as you keep trying to learn more and more each day, each week, you know, you make an effort to do to do that, all those other guys who started at the same time you, you did will never catch up. So that's what I love to do. I love to learn. I love I love to to read about it, write about it, discuss it, teach it, share it, all of that above. And I was lucky enough to have an, an employer early on who saw the value of me attending the, the AWT. So I give a lot of credit to the AWT as well because my career grew up with the, the AWT. And within the AWT, you got Al Bassett has always been a great encouragement for me. Angela Pike, I can't not mention her and so many more who encouraged me to contribute. All, all that I had, and um, you know, for, for, from writing in the, in the analyst to the, the pretreatment subcommittee, we'll, we'll talk about that later, I'm sure. But you know, the, the rest is history. But I love learning, drop by drop, and sharing what I know with others in so many forms. Well, you mentioned learning drop by drop, and I, in my archives on my bookshelf, have a book by you named Drop by Drop. Oh, fantastic! I'm glad you have it. Thank you very much. That that was. That was a fun book to make. It's an assembly of, of articles I'd written for internal and external newsletters um, o- over several years. And it's learning drop by drop. One, one drop at, at a time is very bite-sized. It's very practical. One, one thing that people say about, about my writing is, is it's very practical and usable. And that book now is on every non-frozen continent. And I just ha- had an, uh, a LinkedIn message this afternoon from a guy in Saudi Arabia who just ordered it and he's anxiously awaiting for it he tells me so that's that, that's pretty cool well how about that and as a math and chemistry nerd myself I am amazed at some of the obscure things that you have in there and how you prove some of the things that we do on a day-to-day basis I really enjoy that oh great thank you thank you very much well let me, absolutely well let me ask what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen in water treatment over your career 
when I look at, at water treatment, I, th- I think about the history of water treatment. And I, th- I think of the early days when you hear the legend of the bag of potatoes that, that was hung in the boiler and it was fastened back up and the and the scale was softer the next time they opened it. And, and you hear the, the legends before my time and your time of, um, of, of chromates being used and the, and. and and they were banned in, in cooling towers, and so they, they had to completely change the chemistry of cooling towers to be alkaline-based. You know, those those were big changes, absolutely big changes. And when I think about what we're going through now, you know, we're not going through those big, big changes. Our biggest change right now is is, is Legionella. But, but for chemistry-wise, it seems like the ones we are dealing with today are more gradual with the, you know, the green polymers, the tannins are making a comeback. You know, biocides are being further understood and, and, and the approach with them a bit different with Legionella on board. But perhaps the, you know, the biggest one that's that's making a splash right now after the patents expired um, is, is PTSA for, for controlling our products. So, and you guys are using a, a lot of PTSA at Chem Aqua? Yeah, we do. Yes, we do. So, I know I had Jim Lukinich on a couple of months ago, and we were talking about PTSA. And I think he had mentioned that a lot of people are using PTSA in lieu of some of their other tests that could be absorbed into the system. What do you say about that? And how do you caution your reps around that? Absolutely. The, the, the most important part of any product are the actives actually doing the work. And PTSA isn't doing any work. It's in there in the, in the parts per billion, and there certainly are interferences with that. And it's, it's not tagged to anything. And so absolutely, PTSA should be a guidance, but it should be checked on, on a regular basis, depending upon your system, by actually measuring as many of the actives as you can to make sure that really your product is doing what it should be doing, not what you think it's doing, but not, aren't really sure. I think that's great advice. So you said you now are in your dream job. Can you like, describe? So you say, yes, yes, I, I, I do have my dream job. <laughs> so what is your day to day like? Oh, I, you know, I get, I, number one, I, I work with wonderful pe- people here. I cannot say enough about the people. And I love the variety I have in my job. I don't make the same widget every every single day. I come in and I answer um, technical questions. I get to write about technical issues. I get to make technical tools. I get to work with a team of programmers to, to refine the tools we have. I get to make technical presentations. I get involved in training, uh, making videos website design, graphical design. Um, I have a team I manage. That's Tara and Naomi and Nancy. I do a shout out to them. And just, oh, and the the most important part of my job is telling bad dad jokes. (laughs) Do you have one for us? You know, I'm drawing a blank right now, but I'll tell you what. (laughs) All right, so uh, so so let's get into the epic fail question because because everybody out in the scaling up audience loves the epic fail. Yes. You come up with this brilliant idea, you know it's going to be awesome. You roll it out, you put it out there, and it just falls flat on its face. What was it? Oh man, well well we mentioned my book, Drop by Drop: Articles on Industrial Water Treatment. That is four hundred and eighty six page pages presented one article at a time drop by drop and every one of my mistakes up to that point are in that book <laughs> well there you go <laughs> so, so there you go but there you know everyone has had their their mistakes from before they got soaked with water i went for for years in my career without getting soaked with water and then one day that we were we were installing a new controller on a cooling tower and it wasn't turned on yet and there were like eight people around me and i wanted to look at this one component and i forgot to make sure the valves are turned off and it was isolated. It was offline. And I opened up the, 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 the flow indicator and I got soaked in front of eight people. So I went from years of nothing happening to all of a sudden I had an audience of eight people. <laughs> I know we have all been there. Maybe not around eight people, but I know yeah. we've all have gotten wet from that valve we thought was closed. Yes. Well, uh, it, it's very apparent you love the water treatment industry. So with that being said, what what are some of the things, what are the top items that you love about this industry? Well, am I allowed to say Angela Pike five times? 
Because uh, I believe I, we're on number three right yeah, now, so, so why not? <laughs> there you go. It never hurts to be on our good side. So that's why I thought I'd do that. No, um, seriously, what I love about this industry is you can learn every single day. There's such variety in, in, in what we do. Sure, you, you, you can get stuck in the pinks and blues, but unfortunately, and both fortunately, it's the troubleshooting that really make, makes it interesting. If everything worked every single day, our job would be so boring, but it doesn't because of the nature of, of the job. And I love the people. I mean, I, I, I once had a customer, he would bring me donuts and milk, and we'd sit down and have milk and donuts together before, before we worked. He showed up at my wedding even. And wow. The, yes. And the sharing the sharing of what, of what we know and the fact that we have a venue like the AWT to, to help share all of this is, is fantastic. And I had another, oh yeah, and then the, the problem solving, but we get to live, you know, the show, um, how it's made, we get to live that oftentimes. When we go out to factories, we get to see how so many things are made. I've seen how, how turkeys are defeathered. I've seen how insulation is made with this laser-like stream of molten glass that gets spun out into, into, into insulation. I mean, it's, it's the coolest thing, and we get to live that every single day. I cannot agree more. Well, let me ask the opposite of that question. What don't you like about this industry? What don't I like about, about the industry? You know, I don't don't like when people ignore the closed loops. I believe you mentioned on a previous podcast of yours how that can I be I believe that was a boiling ignored. point. Yes, it was the most ignored portion of a system because, you know, they, they aren't the, the money makers always using chemistry out there. I don't like it when people don't install or use their, their corrosion coupons. You had mm -hmm. mentioned how they can be installed in, in the in the wrong order. Even worse than that, perhaps, is not installing them at all. And you know, I don't like when people do, don't follow up on their promises. But the worst part of, about the in industry sometimes is I don't like it when competitors badmouth each other. I think if you got to sell yourself by badmouthing the other guy, you're missing something. You sell yourself by your qualities and what you offer and, what, and the value you bring. I love that answer. I love that answer. So, uh, so let's get into to some of the things that you're doing. And I know you are very active on social media and especially LinkedIn. So I wanted to spend some time around that because there might be some people in the Scaling Up Nation that aren't aware about that. So uh, tell us what's going on there. Well, on, on LinkedIn, back in 2011, I think it was, I, I wanted to know what LinkedIn was about. People were using it, but I didn't know the power of LinkedIn. So the first thing I did was make my profile, and I wanted the 100% rating, and I kept working and working, making my profile more and more complete, and I couldn't get that 100% rating until I figured out you got to have references as well. I hated to ask anyone for references, but I finally did it, and I got that 100% rating. But I have a very complete profile now because of my efforts on, on trying to reach that. But then I also saw on LinkedIn, they have groups, and I was looking at the groups, and I saw so many of the groups were just commercials and ads and spam and what have you, and I was like, you know, I want to make a group. They, they can make a group. Why can't I? And, but what can I make that's different? So I thought about it, and what I did was I, st I thought, well, instead of my audience asking all the questions, I will flip this paradigm around, and I'll ask all the questions. And I, I wanted to make sure my group didn't compete with the AWT listserv as well, where they allowed you know our members to join the, the the listserv and, and ask all these questions and other members get to answer. So in my group, started in November 2011, I ask a question of the day and, and I have asked up to um, over 900 questions of the day now, never the same question twice because I, I keep track of them on a spreadsheet. I now have um, 12,577 members from wow. 100... Yes, from 143 different countries. And I ask a question and I keep them, you know, simple and broad uh, intentionally. And these people from all these countries answer these questions. And, you know, it's been a fantastic experience. Well, I got to tell you, as a show host, I am so impressed with that. I kind of feel like Mike Rowe every week. If you remember Dirty Jobs, he said, please, if you don't send me ideas, I'm not going to have a show for very much longer. And I, I can't believe coming up with nine, you, 900 unique ideas. That's, that's just amazing to me. 
I think it just shows, you know, the the variety we have in our in, in our career and our, our profession. Because 900, you know, am I, you know, once I reach a, a thousand, I don't know what I'm going to do. And the other beautiful thing about this group is it's a great knowledge tool. It's fully searchable. I go back and I search it sometimes to to find various answers. And 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 I post as well. I, I make a summary of all the questions. I don't make a summary of of all the answers. That takes a lot more work. But I do keep a, a list of the questions in Excel, and I will make that available sometimes so, so people can search that as well to see what, what all I've asked over these years. Well, for those out in the Scaling Up Nation that are not part of your group, how can they join? Well, of course, you have, to have, you have to have a membership on LinkedIn. But once you're in LinkedIn, go up top in the search bar and search for industrial water treatment. That's industrial water treatment. It's a group. You may want to filter down to groups. And once you're there, request to be a member. And every day or two or three, you know, I check to see who's waiting to be a member, and I will approve you. And um, please join us. Um, there, there are people. You know, being a water treater is a lonely job. It really can be. You're out there by yourself. You're a one-man team. Your family has no idea what you do. Your friends have no idea what, what you do. The guy at the coffee shop no idea what you do. And most of your customers have no idea what you do. So I find water treaters oftentimes are hungry to connect with other water treaters. And, and my industrial water treatment group gives water treat treaters another way of connecting with someone else, talking about something which, which interests them. And I swear there are some people out there in, in, in this world who almost wait for that next question of the day because they're on there immediately answering and I love that as I like to say these are 12,577 of my closest friends in water treatment I gotta love it well you weren't happy with just that you're actually doing some other things tell us about those well, also on on LinkedIn, you know, I like to have fun and bring and, and bring some other avenues into into water treatment. So LinkedIn has their Pulse articles, and I have a series. I have a Detective H two O series, and I've written eight articles so far on there. And Detective H two O, it's a guy. His name is Henry. Uh, I'm sorry, Herbert Henry Oxidane PI, otherwise known as Detective H two O, and he faces all these <laughs> water treatment challenges day in and day out, and it is a detective noir noir style, which the beautiful thing about detective noir style is writing badly is good. So I get to write as badly as I want to with all these corny detective type um, sayings, and you know I, I think it's good at least. But I, I have different stories out there. I had the case of the short changing dealkalizer, or the case of high irony for this high iron in a closed loop, or the case of de plume de plume for um, he's talking about a deaerator and how much it ought to be vented or not, or the case of normalization when we're talking about tracking an RO and determining when it ought to be cleaned, in the case of being hammered when we're we're discovering a, a condensate leak, or the case of standing for he discovers why 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 this Condensate polisher isn't working right. Or my last one was a case of breaking free, and it involves you know a microbiologically infowed RO. But it's kind of funny, and the characters that come in, you know, it's it's fun. So when you look me up and you look at my profile on LinkedIn and you look at the things I've I've created, you will see those listed as well. It's just amazing, James. When do you sleep? Uh, well, I have kids too, so not not as much <laughs> as I need to. That's that's for sure. <laughs> oh, and also and also um, on Facebook, I I have an industrial water treatment gr group on there. It's not as active, but on Facebook, be, being more more of an informal type of social media, I I can post some more fun items on there. James, I got to congratulate you. I know one of the reasons I started doing this show was to give people just that extra push because we are alone in our cars and we might need a little bit extra something to get to that next piece of knowledge. And and you've just done so much to achieve that. And I just think it's amazing. I, I applaud you for it. Oh, th thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you, Trace, for, for doing this. When you called me up and told me you you were doing a, a blog, I, I, I'd actually considered, you know, I mean, an online podcast, I'd considered the the same thing before. But when you told me you were doing it, I'm like, I'm not the right guy for that. Trace is the right guy for that. You have that melodic voice that works perfect for a podcast. So thank you very much for doing this. Well, I appreciate that. And I don't know what melodic means, but I'm going to look that up and I'm going to assume it was a compliment. So it thank you. It was. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so, uh, so, so, well, we're just awesome. Let's just agree on that. Well, we are. We are. Yes, yes, yes. Fair enough. Very modest. Modesty is our <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about some of the other things that, that you do around the Association of Water Technologies. And there's a whole bunch of projects in the association that have your name on them. So let's talk a few about those. Sure. Well, I have been the the sub um, the subcommittee chairman of, of of the pretreatment committee for for over a decade now, actually, and. In, in my tenure there, and I have a wonderful team who helped me out with all of these projects, so, so none of these things are, are done alone. But we, the very first thing we made in, on the pretreatment subcommittee was a boiler pretreatment matrix. And you're looking at all the pretreatment options, but it's put into a table format where it tells you, you know, what this pretreatment is, is designed to remove, what are the, the typical flow rates, what are the tests to figure out if it's operating, if it's operating correctly, some, some comments on them. The, the ease of use is, is in there as well. So it's a really good summary of boiler pretreatment and it even got included in the technical reference and training manual as well. So it's part of the boiler chapter there, I think. It might be a part, part of the pretreatment chapter. But we did that. We've also made a series of Microsoft Excel workbooks, and we made them for a water softener, a deoculizer, a reverse osmosis. And each of these um, calculate things like capacity, or but they go beyond that. For for the for the water softener, you also can do an elution study with with one of the forms in there. There's a, a troubleshooting form in there as well. Um, there's a lot of information in there beyond just calculations. There's even a, a resin analysis advice form in there as well. And the pretreatment is very similar to that. And the reverse osmosis Microsoft Excel workbook um, even has the ability to, to, to do an analysis of comparing a boiler with only a water softener makeup source to adding RO as well with the water softener either before or after the RO. So you can do an, an economic um, comparison and economic analysis of, of that too. Yeah, it, it, it's really nice. You can find each of these in the members only section of the AWT website and, and, and look under pretreatment and you'll find those. I've also I have been so lucky to be able to do so much with with, with the AWT to have people believe me, in me enough to ask me to do these things. But when we rewrote the CWT exam, the Certified Water Technologist exam, I got asked to to work on that, and I had no idea how hard it really is to write a good exam. We had a lady working with us who had her PhD basically in exam writing. And she had, she even told us a story where she was helping a plumbing group, a plumbing trade group, write their exam. And she sat down and tucked their old exam. And knowing the mistakes that exam writers make, like like oftentimes the longest option is the answer kind of thing, she was able to pass their exam, not knowing much about plumbing at all, but she could that? have been licensed by, by, by that organization because of that. So that, that was a really neat experience, and it helped make a much better exam than what, what was there before. I've also got involved in the in, in the analyst a lot. I've had several um, articles in, in the analyst, and because um, Ben Bafardi, I gave him an electronic electronic copy of my drop by drop book. Um, he has pulled many articles out, out of that book into the into the analyst as well, which may possibly make me the most published author in the analyst. Well, I think you heard it here first. That's we'll give you that title right there, now. There, there you go. I'll take that. You know, I've dabbled in the marketing committee and I've done some presentations and at, at the convention I've done a, a webinar as well. But what I love uh, about the AWT is that you know, anything you show an interest in, people love being helped in, in, in this organization. And actually, we're desperate for volunteers sometimes as well. And if you have an ability and you have the passion and you carry through on what you say you'll do, you can share that with AWT. Well, let's talk about that for a second, because I know we have so many new members and new faces in the organization, and they might look at somebody like yourself and see that you're the most published person in the AWT, and you're asking for help, and I just don't feel comfortable coming up and asking you if I can help you out. So what advice do you have for those people? I would say, you know, when we have our convention, if, if you, can, you can come to our conventions and the times we have our, our, our subcommittee meetings or our committee meetings... Just come and sit down. We're not going to bug you. We're not going to harass you. We're not going to ask you a hundred questions. Just come in and sit down and listen. And when when we have our our conference calls once once a month, 
just call in and listen. We have plenty of people who do that. There's always a core few who, who really are the ones who are, who are talking and answering questions and, 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 and helping and what have you. But, you know, you, you, you don't have to contribute for, from day one. Come in and listen and learn. And, and as you gain confidence, then slowly over time you can contribute. But we don't expect wonderful, fantastic, you know, sparkly things out of anyone day one. Except for you. Except for me, exactly. Exactly. So what are you working on for AWT right now? Well, right now for the for the pretreatment subcommittee, we're, we're our focus on deoration and deorators. So we're working on our next series of our uh, Microsoft Excel workbooks. So that that's our next thing we're doing. We did just update some minor updates to the that same section on deoration in the technical reference and training manual. And we um, the next thing I got to do is my my subcommittee um, gave me their edits for the pretreatment or the external treatment section of the technical reference and training manual. So I need to assemble all their edits so, so we can turn that into the AWT. So, so that the technical reference and training manual is a living, breathing, accurate document. And that's, that's it. Well, that's it. That's amazing. I mean, you, you, uh, I can't imagine what the AWT would be like if there was no James McDonald. So thanks for everything that you do for our organization. Oh, yeah. Well, let me, let me tell you this. So I was speaking with a member, uh, or a previous member, I should say, here in Atlanta. And I said, you know, I'm looking forward to the convention and I guess I'll see you there. And they're like, no, Trace, we didn't see value in our membership. So we don't pay that anymore because we just, we just don't see that AWT does anything for us. What would you say to that? Oh, my goodness gracious. Number one, he hasn't spoken to, to Angela Pike, who's like a great salesman for the AWT. But number also, four, by the way. Yeah, number four. Yeah, exactly. But also, <laughs> you know, attending the, the conventions is the most valuable thing. You go there not only for the papers, which I like the papers at the AWT convention more than any other conventions I've been to because I feel I get more meat and less commercial out of the AWT papers. And so I learned so much by doing that. And then – talking to other people. The networking is absolutely invaluable, and the AWT is such a rare organization where even though we are competitors across the country, when you pass th through those doors, you're like, you know, you're like normal walking into the bar on Cheers. You know, everyone, everyone is, it, we're friends. It, it, it's like your second family, and I love what I learned from, from my second family like that as well. And you participate in the committees and the subcommittees, and there's member discounts, which which are really important for smaller companies. You got the analyst as well to read. You got all the tools, like the ones we have made for the that's on the members only section. You got the listserv. It's an email. It's an email address. You, you email it out to a distribution list. It goes out to several hundred of your colleagues, and they can answer your question. They and they they can answer almost immediately, even. And and they have the regional trainings. That you know, you you can challenge your employees to to achieve their certified water technologist or CWT licensing, and you can market that to 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 tell your your customers, hey, I'm qualified, I'm extra qualified because we're at CWT, and and all the businesses you have contact with, you know, how often do you get get to see all those vendors in one room to to, to talk with them? So you, you you get to connect with them, and just so much more. I mean, with all of that, how can you say it's not valuable? That's just that's just crazy talk. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. So you're an avid listener of Scaling Up. Yes. And I know you're familiar with my segment that I call the boiling point. Mm -hmm. So why don't we have the James McDonald boiling point? So oh, okay. what are water treaters doing out there that you just wish they would stop doing? Not following through on their promises, but the most annoying thing at all, I think I would say, is bad-mouthing their competitors. I don't think you should be able to sell. You should not try to sell yourself by shortchanging the next guy. You should sell yourself by your attributes, your qualities, the value you bring to a client. Well, let me ask, how do you find new business? Well, you know, in my position here and where, where I was in, in, in Crown, I'm more, I'm more inside. I, I, I have technical support, and I support our guys out there finding their new business. So, you know, I don't have a perfect answer for you. I don't have a qualified answer for you because they do that, and I help them get it. All right. Well, you say, hey, guys, you go find a new business. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, well, well, let me ask this. What are some of the support items that help people get new business? 
Oh, you know, having having the there are several out there. Number one, of course, is you know, they gotta have the people connection, and I've really learned a really appreciation for for the the people side of, of the business over the years. But then behind that, after you get through the front door and past the gatekeeper and all of that, you have that personal connection. Then they need to know that you actually know what you're talking about. And so that's where the training programs come in, whether it's an internal training program or you use the AWT church training programs, what have you, you know, having having your reps trained properly to answer those questions and answer those, those, those questions consistently and having the technical support behind those reps so that when they're honest and they say, you know, I don't know the answer to that, instead of making up an answer, I don't know the answer to that, but my people will. And let me, I'll get back with you on that. Th- those are the tools you need to, to support selling. So when they say my people know it, you're the people. You're the, I, I'm the people. Yes. Well, I'm part of the people. We, we have a wonderful team here. Absolutely. This is some very qualified people. All right. Well, you obviously know a lot about water treatment. So when you want to learn something new, where do you go? I ask my colleagues. I ask the vendors. I research on the, on the internet. I research books. I, I I study it. You know, all the all the above in trade shows and you know, there's so many. We live in in a world now where so much is at our fingertips that you can at least start doing it. And another another way of learning new things is 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 not being afraid of new challenges because you don't know what you don't know until you face a new challenge that points it out to you. Someone once told me that if you were in water treatment and learned something new every single day, you had to be successful. Would you agree with that? Yes, I I, I would agree with that. Would you sub Do you subscribe to that? I absolutely do. I, I try to learn something new every day. It's not always about water treatment, but it's about the other aspects of my job and all around that makes me a, a more well-rounded person. All right. So putting you on the spot a little bit, what new did you learn today? What I learned today? Oh, t- t- today we were videotaping the, the president of our, of our company here for, for a recruiting video. And I was in the background observing the, the tricks of the trade because, you know, I make all, the, all, all this stuff up myself. And so I was watching professionals do, do, do that instead. So I learned some of that. Very cool. All right. So who would you say has helped you the most in your water treatment career? You know, I, I would say it's it's many people, actually. I would include it in that list. One of my closest water treatment friends, Jeff Eldridge, who tucked me on my very first boiler inspection at the Ohio State University um, at Crown Engineering, my first boss, Dave Christofferson, who always encouraged me and shared all of his knowledge with me, spent a lot of time with, with me doing that. And at the AWT, one, one of the first guys I really met there, really, has always encouraged me is, is Al Bassett. He's such a, a good guy. And, of course, you know, I'm mentioning for the fifth or sixth time now, Angela Pike, and, and my current manager, Alan Browning, who continues to support me and all of my passions I have for the, for the water treatment business. So it takes a village. It takes a village. Exactly. Thank you. Well, James, this has been a great interview. It, what, what else do we need to talk about? Have we missed something? There's another thing I wanted to talk about, and that's young professionals and how they're coming into, into the industry and how do they learn what, what they don't know. And I, I was speaking earlier this week with Michelle Farmery, who you had on, a, on another podcast, and we were talking about all the different resources available online out there. I believe she's going to be doing a presentation of some sort on that. And I was going through all the different online resources I use, one of which is the AWT website, members only, and we were listing all the stuff on that. But I also was pointing out other places I go to, like 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 the Taylor Technologies website for the um, for for test procedures, the Aquaphoenix website for their their test procedures, the Hawk website for their test procedures. All these different websites you can go to, and I just happen to own a a, a domain called Industrial Water Science. And I took that discussion that I had with with Michelle and I incorporated it into industrialwaterscience.com. Now, it's still a work in progress, but I would like to encourage your listeners to to go there and and take a look at that, maybe learn about some some new connections to some new resources that that they don't know about. And I also have listed, I I have a detective H2O section, so that's another way to to get to that. But it's it's a work in progress. It's, It's a passion and hobby of mine. So um, yeah, take a look at it. Wow. You know, I, I always thought I was a pretty big cheerleader for the water treatment industry, but I do not hold a candle to you, my friend. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, next up, we've got the lightning round. So are you ready for this? I'm ready for this. 
All right. So what are the last three books that you've read? <laughs> I think that's funny because I have a four-year-old named Noah and a nine-year-old named Gracie, and I'm absolutely positive the last three books I read were all kids' books. All children's <laughs> books. Can you name but, one? Yeah, well, no, I can't really. What, what, are, uh, what, 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 one of them was probably on Rescue Bots, and the other one, one was probably on on Paw Patrol. But they, they were it. But outside of that, in this past week, I've been binge listening to, to to the rest of the Scaling Up podcast as well. But but before that, you know, my books I quote unquote read, I listen to in the car. So I do lots of book books on tape. I, I have anywhere from a forty minute to an hour drive home each day and into work each day. So I got plenty of time to be on the road and listening to books on tape or books on CD. And so before that, I was listening to the, the Bible, actually, the, the New Testament. I, I stopped when I was on Luke, but I used my EWTN app for that. And before that, the books on tape I was listening to, I was going through the whole Dune series. So I, li- I like a, a mixture of, you know, of, of uh, fiction, nonfiction, and business and not well, Dune actually has a water treatment reference because uh, one, of, one of my heroes in water treatment, Jim Lukanich, mm-hmm. uh, he actually explains the corrosion model with, uh, you know, the, the electrons must flow. He says the spice must flow. The spice. So those, oh, uh, I love that. Yes. <laughs> it, yeah. The, the whole water reference in Dune was not lost on me. Most definitely. I am a huge Back to the Future fan. Oh. So, uh, so we're, we're going to get inside a DeLorean. Mm-hmm. And we're going to activate that flux capacitor, and we're going to set the time circuitry back to the first day where you started water treatment. Yes. And you're going to have the ability to get out and advise yourself that first day in water treatment, some advice that you know right now today. Yes. What is it? Well, first off, I'll probably be kind of dizzy because I always thought that would make you kind of dizzy doing that. But I think, you know, I, I'm not one to dwell on, on, on the past or wish I'd done things differently because I know that, that, that the mistakes and right choices I made make me the person I am today. So I think my, I, anytime I think of a question like this, my advice to myself is, is you're going to have a great time. Have a great time. Learn, learn, learn. Share, share, share. Laugh, laugh, laugh. And I think I've done all of that. So keep doing that. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. Because I am a very happy guy. Awesome. And it shows. So, and because of that, obviously they're going to make a movie about your life. Oh, yes. So my question is, who plays you in the movie? And it can't be Angela Pike. <laughs> Oh, I'll tell you what. I picked, and I think this is a perfect choice, Sean Connery, because if he can play James Bond, he's just about qualified to portray James McDonald in water treatment. Just about I don't know if James Bond is as cool <laughs> as James McDonald. I don't, so. I don't know either. We'll have, we'll <laughs> you might be see. selling yourself we'll, short. We'll have to see. Of course, of course, modesty, as I said, is my best treat. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, you and me both. All right. So, uh, so final question. Uh, if you could talk to anybody throughout history, who would it be with and why? Oh, having binge listened to all of your past podcasts, so many people took so many good ones. I, I'd considered ans- answering Benjamin Benjamin Franklin, but that was taken. And the one I really w- w- was going to give was Jesus, but but Michelle took that one, gave a great answer on that. So I want to be original. And I thought I'd come up with, with, with one of the next best things. And my choice is Pope St. John Paul II. He was, he was my pope all through my life, and I've always admired his, his story and making out of the Second World War, you know, being from Poland, becoming pope, all this stuff. But I really loved his strong message on valuing life at all stages, young and old. And he stood as a, as a, as a testament of that because as he became sick, as he became frail, he never gave up. And uh, it, it, to, to his dying breath, he showed life has value at every single second. And I, I, to me, he's a very exceptionally positive influence on the world, all in the name of someone else, not him, someone else. And I greatly admire that. Well, great answer. And I have to say, you are a positive influence on water treatment. And thanks for everything that you do, that you continue to do. And above all else, thanks for being on Scaling Up. I, uh, th- this, this was a lot of fun. I, I think our listeners are really going to enjoy this. And I know I have enjoyed the interview. Well, thank you very much, Trace, and thank you for everything you do You do as well. Uh, we certainly appreciate Trace Blackmore, and we would be less of a, a profession without you. 
Thank you. All right. And with that, we're both awesome. Yes, absolutely. And very modest. So I guess we've all learned from that interview that James and I are both awesome and modest. So what more did you need to learn? Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, I I truly am humbled by James. I feel that on this show and volunteering with AWT that I do a lot for the water treatment community. But when I hear all the stuff that he does, I, I, I do nothing compared to him. So, um Wow. So we're, we're glad that people like him are out there. So let's get into some pinks and blues. And this is where I answer questions that you write into me via my website, scalinguph2o.com. And uh, let me know what you want me to talk about and I talk about it. So the first question that uh, we're going to talk about. And this was a random picking. I just went ahead and randomly picked this out for this show. Sometimes I stack the deck with questions that uh, I feel like talking about more than others, but I didn't do that here. And I actually think we got some interesting questions. One I probably wouldn't have uh, brought on the show. Uh, anyway, I guess I should just ask the questions. So the, the first one is this person just switched hardness manufacturer or hardness test kit manufacturers and the softener used to be soft all the time with the old manufacturer, and now it's hard all the time. So is something wrong with the softener? Is something wrong with the test kit? Well, I want to tell you that here at Blackmore Enterprises, we had that ex same, exact same thing happen. And, uh, and I took some liberties with questions. That's, uh, they asked me some more specific items, but I'm not going to use names or anything like that because uh, I promised you I would never do that here on Scaling Up. But we were using Manufacturer A, and uh, the softener was soft all the time. And then we switched to Manufacturer B, and it was soft some of the time, but a lot of the times we were getting that red red tinge to the hardness test. And as those of you know, out there in the Scaling Up Nation, a soft sample is nice and uh, blue. And if it has a red color to it, then that indicates hardness. And then we add the EDA to it as a titrant until it grabs all that hardness and then turns it blue. So in a softener situation, as soon as we put the buffer in there and the indicator in there, we want that sucker to be nice and blue. Well, we, uh, we thought that the softener was malfunctioning, and uh, it actually was. And the only reason we found that out was because the test that we then started buying with manufacturer B actually was able to test to a, a smaller degree, less than a part per million. The other test was only testing down to like two or three parts per million. And we actually worked with somebody and we sent those off and actually had an independent lab measure those using a different method. And we actually found that out that one of the test manufacturers was able to get that lower. So it might be your tests are working fine, but they're only working in the limits that they are able to work in. And what we did, we, when we did that, we found out that we were actually putting hard water in when we thought we were putting soft water in with the other manufacturer, manufacturer A. And that actually explained some of the readings that we were getting where we were losing alkalinity on occasions and things like that. The boiler was still clean, but everything didn't add up. And then we found that when we were testing with this, with this lower range test kit, that um, we were actually leaking over some hardness. So I say this because the um, boilers, in order to be soft, need to be less, uh, actually, I think it's supposed to be less than half a part per million. So if your test kit's only testing two or three, when it says it's soft, that's several times higher than half a part per million. So make sure you know what your test kit is actually uh, doing and even in the same manufacturers, they have different ranges. So if one drop equals 10 parts, that's probably not good. When your titrant, that's probably not good enough for a softener. You probably want to figure out either how to change the sample size 
or uh, maybe change the test kit so you can you can get that to a really fine amount. But then also realize that your test that you're using may not go as low as you think it goes. So hopefully that helps. The next question is, this is uh, the question that I think is fun because it asked me, it says, Trace, what do you do for fun? So that has to be a fun question, right? I think I talked about this when I interviewed myself on the second show, but maybe I didn't. I am a scuba dive instructor. That is my passion. I absolutely love being underwater. It is uh, the most therapeutic thing that I can think of. Uh, underwater, you can uh, fly around like Superman. Uh, you want to go up, you go up. You go down, go down. You can bank left, bank right. It's totally awesome. And I love it so much. And, and you out there in the Scaling Up Nation know that one of my passions is teaching. So I actually teach scuba diving to other people and try to get them to enjoy it as much as I do. So uh, to answer your question, and I don't even have to think about it, what I do for fun is I scuba dive. And I know Mark Lewis has been brought up on this show. Uh, Mark Lewis and I scuba dive together. So, so there you go. It's fun for water treaters to get, to get together. And, you know, we're working in water and now we're, we're playing in water too. So just have a whole life that uh, talks about water or deals with water. So thanks for asking that question. I, I, I enjoy talking about that. Oh, oh, and by the way, I want to say that teaching scuba diving has made me a better instructor because when you're teaching somebody that they're not going to die, you learn how to deal with people at a different level because everybody's scared that, you know, there's no air underneath that water and you've got to convince them that if an emergency or if a situation, I should rather say, happens underwater, you can deal with it underwater and not panic and go up to the surface because when you take my dive class, you will learn that once you have all that pressure under you underwater and then you get up too quickly and that pressure is gone, you can actually hurt yourself. And uh, I have to convince people that when their brain is going through that, something's wrong. Okay, do I fight it or do I flight it? That they have to go through that fight function because if they flight it, they can actually turn an inconvenience into an accident. So being able to deal with people on that level, I think has made me a much better instructor when it comes to water treatment, because on a good day, nobody dies in water treatment. Uh, normally people don't die in scuba diving. So that's probably a bad analogy. But that being said, you know, it's, it's, it, just dealing with people on that level, I think, has made me a better instructor. Okay, let me move on to my final question. Otherwise, I will keep talking about scuba. Maybe I'll do a, pod show, a podcast just on uh, scuba. So this last question is, uh, uh, which is better, LSI, RSI, or PSI? So for those of you out there in the Scaling Up Nation that uh, don't know what those letters stand for, so there's the Longelier Stability Index, the Risner Stability Index, and the Practical or sometimes called Pecorious Scaling Index. So which one's better? For those of you that listen to this show, better is not a word that I really like, but I understand why you ask it. But better is an opinion. So I'm going to explain what they are, and then I'm going to explain to you why I use one and then you get to make the choice for yourself. So the LSI, so let's back up. All of them are the same thing. What they deal with is when calcium carbonate comes out of solution or goes into solution, okay? We're either precipitating or we are dissolving, if you will. And right in the middle, where neither of those has happened, is called the, the saturation pH. So that's the equation that all of these different scales use, and then they do something with it to make it unique, and then they can name it something else like LSI, RSI, or PSI. So LSI takes the um, saturation pH, and what you do is you take the system pH and you subtract the saturation pH from it, and then that's LSI. And the range from that is negative three to three. And then anything above zero, is uh, has a scaling tendency anything below zero has a non-scaling tendency notice i didn't say have a corrosive tendency as a lot of those charts will actually say 
we're all water traders. We know water is the universal solvent, i.e. all water is corrosive. Now, some water might be more aggressive than others, depending on what's dissolved in it. But that being said, all water is corrosive. So I look at these as uh, scaling indexes or stability indexes, and it's either scaling or non-scaling. So then we get the RSI, the Risner Stability Index. And what that does is it takes the saturation pH times two, and then it takes that quantity and subtracts it from the system pH. And that's a range between zero and 12. And anything above six has a non-scaling tendency, and anything below six has a scaling tendency. And then... We get uh, Mr. Paul Pecorius, who has yet to be on my show. Paul, if you're out there, if someone knows Paul, I want to know where this equation came from. I've got lots of questions for you, so please contact me. I've been trying. So uh, what Paul did is he took the saturation pH and multiplied it by 2, just like we did at RSI, but then he subtracted it. Instead of using the system pH, he used the pH of equilibrium. And here's the question that I have from, for Paul. The uh, pH of equilibrium is 1.465 times the log of the M alkalinity. And then that quantity is added to 4.54. Any of you that have taken my math class know that I do not like constants because when you say, hey, what's that constant? People say, oh, that's a rule of thumb. And that's just a way for people saying, I have no idea what it is. Just plug it in and don't ask me any more questions. But I don't like that. I don't want to just simply learn how to do an equation. I want to understand an equation. So that's what I need help with, Paul. I don't understand one where the 1.465 comes from. And I don't understand why we're adding 4.54 to that. So please come on the show and let me know why that is the way it is. Oh, and by the way, that scale is exactly the same as the RSI. It's 0 to 12. Above 6 is a non-scaling tendency and below 6 is a scaling tendency. So the question is which one is better? So which one you think is better? Which one works best for you? Colin Frayne actually has my uh, best definition and uh, for those of you who know Colin Frayne, he's English and I am not, so I'll try to do my best Colin Frayne. He says, if LSI is scaling, then RSI says it's really scaling. And if RSI says it's really scaling, then PSI says it's really, really scaling. And then he says something like, tally-ho, pip-pip, Bob's your uncle, something like that. Colin, please forgive me. But no, that's exactly, I mean, that's pretty much what it says. Now, which one is the best for you? You get to choose. You know where they come from. Now, I'll tell you the one that I use is RSI. And the only simple reason that I use RSI is because that's what my father used and that's what he taught me. So that's what I'm used to. So we here at Blackmore Enterprises, we use RSI, not because one's better than the other, but because that's what I'm used to. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I don't think I answered your question. But I gave you some things to think about. And folks, that's the whole purpose of this show. I hope it sparks a little bit more of what you're thinking about. Or maybe you had a question, but you didn't really go to find the answer. And now this show gives you just that little push to make you want to get a little bit better and understand what you do on a day-to-day -day basis a little bit better. And if it's doing that, I'm doing my job, and of course, my job is bringing you scaling up, and I'm glad you're listening to it. I hope you make tomorrow a chance to be a better water trader than you were today, and I hope you join me next time on Scaling Up.